The, uh, the title of the message tonight is Silencing the Critics. <laughs> Silencing the Critics. We've been in uh, the book of Peter for a, a few weeks now, and uh, the beginning part, we've used the title or the heading, uh, God's Grace and Salvation. And he talks about uh, some areas of salvation that are, are such a blessing. You know, we have a, a hope. We, we live in hope because of the resurrection. Verse, chapter 1, verse 3, uh, he's begotten us again unto a lively hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, you know, that's what salvation's all about. He, he gives us that blessed hope. Uh, and then he says, because of that, uh, we live in holiness. Uh, not only the holiness that God gives us, but uh, the, the practical uh, side of it. In verse 13, wherefore, you know, because of our salvation, because of our hope, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that's to be brought unto you, the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as, as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Uh, God's grace and salvation. Then uh, we looked at how uh, we, we live in harmony because of salvation. In the verse 22 of that chapter, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Uh, you know, we're saved, we're, sa we're all saved the same way, uh, we're all saved uh, to be a part of, uh, of this thing of Christianity, uh, all followers of Christ together. God's grace and salvation. Uh, what a blessing as you, as you see it. And remember that the book has to do with trials. It, it, it was written to a scattered uh, people, a persecuted people. And, uh, you know, as Christians, uh, this world's not our home. But we're in it together. <laughs> uh, we have the Lord and we have each other. And uh, that's a blessing wherever we go. I don't know if you've found it, but uh, we've found when we travel, uh, you, you can even be in a country where you don't speak the same language. And when you're with other Christians, there's just that, uh, that bo common bond. And it, it's a blessing uh, to see. Of course, it should be stronger uh, in your own church, uh, but uh, you, know, you, can, you can see it wherever you go. Well, the, the second area we're going to look at is God's grace and submission. As Christians, uh, because of uh, our standing in, in Christ, he calls us to be faithful witnesses. If you look at uh, chapter 2, verse 9, he, looks at, he gives us some of these privileges, some of them. Chapter 2, verse 9, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. You know, God saved us. He's made us. Th those words peculiar means we're, we're his people. We belong to him. And we've talked about how, uh, you know, he's given us a, a hope. He's given us an inheritance. He's given us security. Uh, we have privileges. And he says at the end of that verse, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Uh, we're saved to, to be uh, witnesses. We're saved to be uh, a light in a dark world. You might say we have privileges, but we also have responsibilities. And when you get saved... Riches are just, you just can't even write them all down. You know, you couldn't understand them all until we get to heaven, I think. But we also have responsibilities as Christians. And so these people originally that he was writing to were a scattered people in hostile territory. And, you know, it's pretty much the same today, isn't it? Uh, God calls us to live a righteous life in a hostile environment. And we'll, we'll see some of those things about that. Uh, in the next, uh, the rest of the chapter... He gives us three aspects of, of our testimony uh, in the world. And the first one is that we're aliens. Now, you know, nowadays when you use that word, people think of different than uh, what the word really means. But uh, we're aliens. I remember when we first came to Australia, um, they, they actually went door to door asking if people had voted after an election. It's been a long time ago. You know, it was probably you know, 100 years ago or something. Uh, and uh, they, they knocked on our door, did you vote in the election? I said, no, we're aliens. <laughs> that was kind of fun to say, you know. Uh, but as Christians, that, that's always true. And sometimes we struggle with that because there's just a natural desire to want to fit in, isn't there? You know, you see it in young people, especially. Probably every parent has said to their kid, if everybody else jumped off a cliff, would you jump off a cliff? 
<laughs> you know, uh, we do things just to fit in sometimes. And sometimes it's pretty stupid. Uh, you know, you see some of the, the ways people dress and, and, and do. Not just our culture, many cultures. Uh, but as Christians, we're aliens. And that's part of our testimony. We're also citizens. Now, talking about using that term as that we're also human beings. You know, we're, we're people, too. So let's, let's read, starting in verse 11. 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to, king, uh, to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, the next one we'll look at next week is, is, is servants. That, that's another aspect of, of our testimony. But uh, the first one tonight is that we're aliens. Uh, probably the key verse, I would say, would be verse 15. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Someone has said, I, I'm not sure uh, who I'm quoting here, but uh, they said, show me your redeemed life and I might be inclined to believe in your Redeemer. You know, our testimony makes a difference. We are the people of the Lord. Jesus said in Matthew 5, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Uh, we're part of the light. And let me say this, non-Christians need us to be different. They need that. Now, they may not like it. They might try to kill us for it. But he, he talked, and we'll get to it later when, at the end of verse 13, it says, they may by your good works which they should behold glorify God in the day of visitation. I'll guarantee you, if they get saved, they'll thank you for living for the Lord. Uh, we're aliens. Uh, he uses the term there, strangers and pilgrims. It, it's exactly what it means. And it starts because we're different on the inside. It's because you've trusted it, we're, we're strangers and pilgrims because we've trusted Christ as our Savior. And he's, he's made us new. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. We're different on the inside. So verse 11, you might say, our discipline is inward and private. You know, there's, a, there's a change that God started, and we need to cooperate with him. And, and that change inwardly needs to be uh, growing. God calls us to purity. And he says there in, in verse 11, that these fleshly lusts war against our very soul. We have an alien soul. <laughs> and uh, the things of the world are, are against that, trying to pull us down, trying to, to defeat us. And he tells us to abstain from fleshly lusts. That's the cravings of the flesh. I, I think we know what that is. I mean, you know, we've all dealt with various ones. First uh, John, he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof. You see what Satan's, the world's trying to get us into? He's trying to get us into something temporary that's going to be destroyed. You know, what a waste of time that is to live for the lust of the flesh. The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. God knows that you have an eternal soul. And he wants you to have eternal, oh, what's, what's the word I want to use? Prosperity comes to mind. That's not really the word I'm looking for. Uh, benefit. He wants you to benefit eternally. Uh, uh, the lust of the flesh war against our soul. There's several places where God gives us some pretty good lists. Uh, I, I'm almost hesitant to, to read any of them. One of them we, we read when we looked at the, uh, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Right before God tells us the fruit of the Spirit, he tells us the works of the flesh. It's an awful list. It's nobody's life verse. I'll put it that way. Uh, uh, the works of the flesh are manifest which of these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, 
And it goes on and on, you know, just a, a terrible list of things. And one of the things we need to understand is, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 3, I'm going to read several verses there. That terrible list, the world will think it's strange if you don't participate in that. And that's what Peter says here. Let me read 1 Peter 4 verse 3. For the time past of our life may sufficeth, sufficeth to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked, past tense, we walked in the lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. He says, that's the way we used to live. You know, that was time past. Wherein, hey, this is the world, they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. What? You're not going to go to this drunken party and rage with us? You're not, you know, all kinds of things where they'll, man, they really condemn us. Uh, you turn on the news almost any day, and there's someone condemning godliness. Oh, that church, they're against homosexuals. They're, they're prejudiced. Um, the Bible says in verse 5, who shall give account to him that's ready to judge the quick and the dead. Listen, God will, God will uh, sort things out. But you know, the world will think it's strange when we don't live like that. And we need to understand it's a war against the soul. We're aliens. If you don't, if the things of the world are natural to you, beware. You may not have been converted. You know, if it's easy for you to slip back into the world and feel no tug at your conscience, man, watch out. Work out your own salvation and make sure you're saved. But when you're saved, listen, we'll, we'll do wrong. But our Heavenly Father will convict us. He'll not let us rest easy with it. Uh, we are resident aliens. Uh, in Hebrews 13, uh, 14, he, he puts it this way. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. <laughs> uh, we're never quite at home here. We're aliens. We're seeking uh, one to come. Uh, you you might have read... Uh, John Bunyan's book uh, about Pilgrim. What was the name of that? Uh, Pilgrim's, Pilgrim, yeah. Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, he also wrote a, a story called The Holy War. It's about this very thing, the, the battle against your soul. Uh, probably be good to read it. Uh, read the scripture first. But uh, the, the key to our being different is internal. Uh, there was a changed heart. But let me point something out there in, in 1 Peter 2 and and verse uh, 11, God doesn't see us as aliens. God sees us as beloved, dearly beloved. Aren't you glad? You know, when you get saved, uh, you're no longer separated from God. Uh, there's no longer that, uh, that gap, that, that alien, you know, that enmity that the Bible talks about. Uh, we're his children, and, and we're welcomed, and he loves us. Uh, so he starts off, uh, one of the differences for us is the discipline that's inward and private but in verse 12, it leads to the deportment that's outward and public. Now, deportment is just another word for the King James uses the word conversation, uh, your manner of life, the way you live. Uh, it's outward. You know, people are going to see how we live. And, and I'll tell you, there's people are watching. If there's people who know you're a Christian, they're watching. You know, you take something home from work you're not supposed to, oh, 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 oh boy, they'll know it. Uh, you know, they're, they're watching. God doesn't believe in, in uh, secret disciples. And uh, the, world, the world knows. Uh, this inward thing has to do with purity. Okay, God calls us to purity. The outward part is fruitfulness. God wants us to be a, a witness to those around us, especially, well, first of all, just by how we live. Conversation, I mentioned, it means manner of life, your conduct. And isn't it interesting there in verse 13, I'm sorry, verse 12, they speak against you as evildoers. I don't know if this is in other English-speaking places, but here in Australia, we, the, they speak very derisively about do-gooders. Have you ever been around a do-gooder? Oh. <laughs> Isn't it strange that that, that would be a, a word of, of criticism? Wouldn't you rather have somebody do good to you and for you than do evil? And they call us evildoers. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's so strange. The, the early Christians, and all along in history, Christians have been accused of all kinds of things. 
Did you know where the, the idea of, of witches riding broomsticks came from? It came from Christians who, when they would come to arrest them, the pastor would be gone because they had, they had put out watchers so that when the soldiers or the police came to arrest them, oh, it was like a magic. The pastor was no longer there. And so the rumor went out. He jumped on a broomstick and flew away. That's exactly where that came from. Nothing to do with witches, but they accuse us of witchcraft, evildoers. Uh, they call us, they thought some of the early Christians were cannibals. Oh, they, they have the Lord's Supper. Oh, they're eating flesh and blood in there. They're cannibals. Oh, lock up your children. <laughs> uh, you know, all kinds of things have been said about Christians. Um, they've been called traitors. You know, because this world's not, not our home. Uh, they wreck homes. Uh, they're, in some places, they, they've been considered atheists. Oh, you're, you know, a Christian. That's as good as an atheist. You, know, you don't believe in our God. Uh, and the Bible talks there in verse 12 about the day of visitation. I, I mentioned that. I believe, and I'm sure there's different opinions on this, but it says that they call us evildoers. They may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. I believe that day of visitation is the day they get saved. That doesn't mean everybody's going to get saved. But if someone gets saved, uh, it's going to be because someone lived for the Lord. Someone had a, a, a godly standard. Someone shared Christ with them. And uh, you know, when the Lord comes and visits them, they say yes. C can you imagine witnessing to the to Paul before he was a Christian. He, he would have called Christians evildoers. But when he got saved, boy, he, he glorified God, didn't he? In the Old Testament, the day of visitation uh, was when God came to visit either in judgment or in blessing. Uh, it could be either one of those. Uh, I'll read you a couple of examples from Jeremiah 27 and, and verse 22. You can just listen to these if you want. He's talking about Israel. He says, They shall be carried to Babylon, and there shall they be until the day that I visit them, saith the Lord. Then will I bring them up and restore them to this place. I said, I'm going to visit them. I'm going to bless them and bring them back out of captivity. Uh, one that comes to my mind is uh, 1 Samuel 2, where um, uh, Hannah, you remember Hannah? Uh, she had no children, and uh, she was you know, so distraught and, and praying and, and so on. Uh, in 1 Samuel 2 and verse 21, and the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived. Just saying, uh, God came and, and blessed her. Well, in, in the New Testament, it always has to do with redemption. Uh, for instance, Luke chapter 1, and, and I'll give you several here from Luke. Luke 1 and, and verse uh, 68 Zechariah is, is uh, speaking, and he says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. He's talking about the coming of John the Baptist and then, and then Jesus. You know, the Redeemer is coming. God is, is blessing us. In Luke 7, verse 16, There came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying, this, this was after Jesus raised someone from the dead. He did a miracle. A great prophet has risen up among us, and God hath visited his people. You see, they, they were understanding this, this concept. Later on in, in Luke 19, verse 44, it's kind of, it's kind of a negative positive. He says, uh, talking, about, um, anyway, talking about Jerusalem, shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave on thee in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. So he's saying, you know, God came to bless you, and you, you didn't receive him. So the day of, uh, of visitation, I believe, is when, when God comes to someone, and particularly someone who's, who trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior. And uh, you know, they'll glorify God. They might call us evildoers. Uh, you know, there's, there's people who uh, were torturers of Christians who've gotten saved because of, of Christians' testimonies. Uh, it's just an, an amazing thing. The, the Bible says uh, there in, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12, by your good works, which they shall behold. You know, we have a testimony to people around us. People hear what we say. They, they see the expressions on our face. Uh, you know, they, 
They live next to us. They, they, they experience how we live. And it's a testimony uh, for the Lord Jesus. I got a little confused this morning, and I shared an illustration I meant to share tonight uh, about those missionaries in, in the Philippines. Uh, but that's all right. Uh, as they were harassed and, and in, in uh, prison internment, uh, that terrible guard was impressed with their kindness to his cruelty. And, and it made a difference in his life. See, we're, we're aliens. We're, we're not meant to respond the same way other people do. Yeah, you know, the world, it's, you know, you hit me, I'll hit you twice. Uh, with, with us, Jesus said, we, we turn the other cheek. Uh, we bless them. We pray for them. Uh, we're aliens. But to make it even more difficult, we're also citizens. <laughs> uh, we're fellow human beings. In uh, verses 13 through, through 17, he starts it with this, this word, submit. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Uh, you know, our character should show that we're aliens, different to those around us. But folks, we must not be indifferent to those around us. We need to remember where we came from. We need to remember, uh, you know, what it was to be lost. Now, some of us got saved as children, and so it's, it's, it's a, a vague memory. Some of you got saved as adults. You know exactly what it's like to live in the world. Uh, we don't need to be holier than thou in the sense of our, our attitude. Uh, we need to submit. We need to, uh, to have compassion uh, for people around us. And we need to understand the battle is not with, really with people. It's people that will harass us. It's like he talks there about they'll speak against you as evildoers and, and so on. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against, uh, I always get this part mixed up, uh, powers and uh, power and, uh, let me read it here, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our, our battle, our real battle is a spiritual battle. It may be people that confront us, but they're a slave, they're uh, condemned, they're, uh, you know, they're under the power of the one that we're, we're against. We're not against them. We're against the, uh, the, the power behind them. Uh, we're, we're citizens. Where they are, we once were. Uh, look at Titus chapter 3. And, and verse 1, it's kind of a similar passage where he talks about submitting to authority. Titus 3, verse 1 says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. Uh, he's not talking there about spiritual principalities and powers. He's talking about physical ones. To obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also are sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. And then, look at verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Listen, if you're saved, it means you realize at some point that you were a lost person person. You were a sinner. And you know, were confronted all around us by sinners. Living a sinful, ungodly life. That shouldn't surprise us. <laughs> it, should, it, it always surprises me when somebody has a, a godly attitude, you know, especially lost people. Um, we should understand, we're, we come from the same place. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Uh, where we were is where they are. And the command that God gives us, and this, there's some difficult things here, but he says uh, we're to submit to authority over us. And uh, God says he's the one that, that puts them in authority. Uh, verse uh, 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the kings as supreme or unto governors. And verse 15, for so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Uh, you know, the command is, is to submit. There's a tremendous illustration of this with Israel. 
Remember, Israel was taken into captivity. And uh, God told them through Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, that they should just do their best to fit in and, and, and bless the country they were in. Well, they had, they had other prophets who weren't of God who were saying, no, no, we don't listen to Jeremiah. Let me read it to you. Jeremiah 29, verse 4. Thus saith the Lord, God, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. Listen to this. And seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. Now, folks, we're aliens, but we're aliens living in, in, a, in hostile territory. And we want to we be a blessing where we are. We want to be light in a dark world. We want to be you know, salt to a place that, that needs it. Now, Israel in captivity, God said, you be a blessing to those people. Now, that's a pretty good illustration for us. Uh, you know, Jesus said, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are God's. Uh, in Romans 13, we'll, we'll look there uh, later, but in uh, Romans 13, verse 1, uh, God tells us very plainly, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. You know, when we have a government over us, uh, God says, that's, that's your government. And stop and think about the government that they had, Rome. You know, it had some, there's some, there were some good things about it, but there were some bad things about it. And uh, they were kind of a captive country, weren't they? Uh, the, the command is submit. The motive, he says there in, in verse uh, 13, is for the Lord's sake. We do it for the Lord's sake. Now, let me give you three reasons here. The first one is because God says so. You ever say that to your kids? Why? Because I said so. <laughs> and that's really about, that's all the reason you really need, when, especially when it's from the Lord. Uh, God says so. Submit for the Lord's sake. But as well, we do it to imitate him. Jesus submitted to the things that uh, he had to submit to. Uh, we read this morning in, in 1 Peter 2.21, uh, Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Now we want to imitate Jesus. But as well, we do it to glorify the Lord. And that's what verse 12 is about. Uh, they, shall, uh, they shall be whole and they'll glorify God on the day of visitation. And we submit ourselves uh, for the Lord's sake. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, you know, he says, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Uh, do turn to Romans chapter 13 there. I'd, I'd like to point out a few things there. Romans chapter 13. We, we read verse 1. And he gives us a couple more reasons here, uh, motivations to submit ourselves to uh, those that God has put over us. Verse 2. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. Next time you see a policeman, just remember, he's a minister of God. Say, tell him that if, if you get a chance. The Bible says you're a minister of God. Did you know that? <laughs> uh, don't get arrested. But, uh, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. This is one of the verses we look to for the death penalty. God gives governments the power of the sword. Verse 5, Where, uh, Wherefore you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. So he give us, gives us several motivations there. You know, we saw we're to submit uh, for the Lord's sake, but he says here we're also to submit for wrath's sake. You know what that means? It means if you break the law, you're going to get punished. <laughs> you speed, you're going to get a fine. You steal something, you're going to end up in jail. He says, just common sense, really. Uh, God gives them the authority to, 
to punish. Uh, in uh, the book that we're in, just, just stay there in, in Romans for a moment, but uh, 1 Peter 4.15, he says, Let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or a busybody. He says, you know, as Christians, uh, we shouldn't be breaking the law uh, for wrath's sake. But then he, also, he says also for conscience' sake. We need to do what's right just because it's right. We need to do it before the Lord. Uh, if we're arrested, I think it was the Christians in Romania uh, I, I think I'm right in saying that. They decided that if they were going to be arrested, it was not going to be for protesting or you know, opposing the government. It was going to be for preaching the gospel. Listen, if we're going to get arrested, let's get arrested for doing right, not for opposing other people. I, I, I mentioned to you there, verse, 1 Peter 4, 15, verse 16 says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Listen, it's all right to suffer being a, for being a Christian. Somebody has said, most of us, if we're on trial for being a Christian, there might not be enough evidence uh, to convict us. But, uh, you know, we need to live the Christian life. We have a testimony. Uh, people need uh, us to be different so that they can see that there is a choice. You know, most people in life think there's no choice. They just think they have to be like their parents and their grandparents and so on. Uh, God gives us a, we can choose life for conscience sake. And you know, as you read your Bible, you won't find Paul and Jesus and the Christians and the Jews protesting against their governments. I'm talking about the Christians. What they did is they preached the gospel. Let me tell you, there's plenty wrong with their governments. Uh, but you do see them preaching, even when they were told not to. Uh, folks, our weapons are spiritual and mighty. Uh, the Bible tells us that in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses 3 and 4. He says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Folks, we wield the sword of the Spirit. And that's the key. It's not our arguments. It's not our personality or even our person. It's God's Word, the sword of the Spirit that, that people need to have. So God gives us the command, submit. Uh, the motive is the glory of God. Uh, this next one is, to me, it's kind of hard. The extent is, where am I here? First Peter, yeah, I think that's where we are. First Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Submit yourself to every ordinance of man that you like. Now, to every ordinance of man. That's the extent. Now, and then he talks about every ruler, basically, kings and, and governors and so on. Now, we've, we've got to understand that in a, in a biblical context. But that's, that's the extent that he, he gives us. And the reason is there in verse 15. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You know, oftentimes the world will have weird ideas as to what Christians are and what they do. And we need to live honest, godly, productive lives before them. I remember I was uh, up on my roof. I've had a couple roofs now where I've cleaned them and painted them. And I remember one of our ladies saying, oh, I can't imagine the pastor up on the roof. Well, who's going to do it if I don't do it? I mean, you know, uh, we, just, we just need to live normal, godly, honest, hardworking lives. And people need to see us doing that. We need to help our neighbors when, when they're in need. And we need to, you know, just do the things that a, a good person should do. Uh, the reason is that's the will of God. And we need to do right. You know, we shouldn't be stealing and, uh, the things that are, are wrong. And the attitude is there in verse 15. I'm sorry, verse 16. As free. Then he puts a qualifier. And not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. So he says, we do this because we're free. We're the servants of God. We have a testimony to those around us. You've probably known people who used their Christianity as a battering ram, who used it to offend people, who used it to oppose the government. You hear people say, oh, I'm not paying my taxes. Well, listen, you should go to jail if you don't pay your taxes. God says to pay your taxes. He didn't say, oh, well, they use it badly. Well, I'm sure Rome used their taxes badly too. And Jesus said, you give to Caesar the things that are, that are Caesar's. 
And there's people who twist this all around and try and make their Christianity some excuse for sinfulness. And God says we're free as the servants of God. We're free to do right. And uh, that's, that's an important thing for us to understand. The application is there in verse 17. Now, this is what, who it applies to. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. As far as I can see, that's everybody. <laughs> it applies to everybody. Uh, mentioned this morning, you know, we may not respect everybody. We may not respect their actions, but we do need to respect their position. I'm talking especially about those in leadership. You know, if a policeman stops you and has a foul mouth and a bad personality, listen, get over it. You honor his position as, as a policeman. Uh, many of our politicians, you know, you, you think, oh, I don't really like that guy, but, uh, you know, we need to honor them as, as the leaders that God has allowed to be in place. Uh, we need to be careful what we say and, and what we do. Uh, he says, honor all men. Love the brotherhood. We need to have a right attitude toward other Christians. Uh, fear God. Honor the king. God is saying we submit. We have a testimony uh, to those around us. First, as aliens. We're different. But also as citizens. We're not different. <laughs> you know, we, are, we come from the same place. We, are, we all come from Adam. Uh, we have a testimony. And folks, God has placed us here. You ever thought about this? We don't live in a different century. We don't live on a different continent. Some of us used to, but God, somehow God brought us all here. Man, there's people from all different continents here, aren't there? God's brought us here. Uh, he's put us in this, this situation, these circumstances, with these people. And that's how God expects us to serve Him. In this place, this time, this circumstance, for His glory. It's a blessing. Let, let me read verse 11 and 12 again. Dear, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And then verse 15, For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Uh, you know, Jesus led the way. Now, he set the example, like it says in, in verse 21. Uh, what a blessing it is uh, to be a Christian. I count it an honor and a privilege to have other Christians, you know, to be a pastor and to have a church and, and so on. I don't know what the situation was for the people that, that Peter was writing to. I, I think they had churches, but, you know, some of us, they had to meet in secret and uh, all kinds of things went on. Th that could happen to us. We might become God's scattered people, but we still have these promises. And we still have this, uh, uh, this calling, you know, to represent the Lord and uh, that others can see Jesus in us. I thought we'd close uh, singing uh, a couple of songs. We're going we're gonna to start with number 10. Uh, I have decided to follow Jesus. I'm pretty sure I got the right numbers tonight. I'll, I'll just lead these. Uh, number 10, I have decided to follow Jesus. I hope that's true. Let's stand together as we sing, and we'll sing one, one more after this. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back.